got a funny title today. It's the message is kind of about children. In fact, it's one of the places in Scripture where God talks about children more than, than almost any other place. So the title is called Children Matter, An Unexpected Message on Church Discipline, <laughs> Part 1. Next week we'll get to Part 2. Children Matter, An Unexpected Message on Church Discipline, Part 1. Let's pray. Lord God, we're here and we're so glad to be in your presence. Father, we're eager and expectant to hear from you. Lord, uh, please uh, help my voice to hold out today. Help us to uh, really be attentive to what your spirit has for us this morning. Lord, uh, please glorify yourself through our church this morning. Thank you for everyone who's here. I pray this in your name. Amen. <coughs> Do you know that God loves kids? It's, it's so beautiful. Isn't that cool? Uh, God, who's got this big, huge universe, uh, God designed those chubby cheeks the way he wanted to. I mean, have you thought about that when you see a child's huge cheeks that God wanted it that way? I remember when Chie was little, I don't know, is this child abuse? We'd, we'd grab her cheeks because from the inside of her mouth, the outside was just so thick, it was just ridiculous, you know. God cares about children, but not like a cute grandma or a, a funny uncle. You know, the uncle kind of winks at you when you're doing something bad. Uh, God's love for children is a lot more like a mama lion watching over her cubs. God's love is fierce and dangerous. Now, before we go any further, I want to clarify our terms when we say children, because this is always confusing. This always gets people off course. Uh, number one, sometimes when we talk about God's children, we mean everyone on the planet, everyone who's ever been born. Everyone, in a sense, is part of God's big family. Everyone is a child of God, in a sense, because God's made everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter what race you're from. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter anything about your education. You're all made in the image of God. Everybody is a child of God, in a sense. The second way, though, we talk about children of God is Jesus talks about being born again. It's a second birth. It's, it's, a, it's coming into the family. The Bible talks about us getting adopted into God's family when we choose to follow Christ. In this second sense, then, only the people who want to be part of God's family are then considered uh, true children of God in this sense. There's a third way the Bible talks about children, though, and this, this is really theological, philosophical, hard to understand. In this third sense, when God talks about children, he means kids, small humans, little guys that haven't grown up yet, uh, chubby-cheeked guys uh, that got food smeared on the side of their face. Uh, sometimes when the Bible talks about children, it just means kids. It's this third sense that we're going to be looking at today, and it's important that we understand these distinctions because if you're confused, if you, um, let's start over. Brothers and sisters, friends, if you have confessed your sins to God, you say, boy, God's ways are better than my ways. And I want to follow God. I want to be part of his family. I want to be part of his, fam uh, his plan, his, his great agenda. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you said, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins because my sins are so nasty. Thank you for forgiving me. Guess what? You are a child of the king of the universe. Uh, but listen, that doesn't mean God sees you as a baby. You're his child, but you're not a baby. Or that he's going to treat you like a baby. <clears throat> I often hear non-believers say something like, listen to this. This is cool. If you're a non-believer, you love this. Uh, you love your kids, Dan, and the Bible teaches that God loves his kids. You would never say to your toddler, obey me, 
or I'm going to burn you with fire. Yet, you worship a God that basically says, do what I say, or I'm going to burn you with fire forever. And then you sing songs about how great he is and how much he loves you. Well, there's something wrong with that analogy, isn't it? The Bible teaches us that God created us in his image, full of glory. Human beings have incredible potential. The Bible says we're God-like. And God also created us to be loved by him and to respond to that love with love. Don't think of yourself as a little baby, oh, I can't help it, the world is, I can't, don't have any freedom, I can't make any choice, the world puts me around. You're not a robot. Uh, I know I'm not a robot because robots, when they make a mistake, they get reprogrammed and they don't make the same mistake again. Uh, I know I'm a robot because I can struggle with the same sins for forever, for, for a lifetime. Impatience. Maybe, maybe I'm not as impatient as I once was. I really believe God's working on that, but I have my days. You know, if I was a robot, I'd push the no more impatience button. I'd be done with it. I'm not a robot. We're not forced to be good. We're not programmed to love God. Guess what? If you were programmed to love God, that would not be love. That would be a program. What I think that atheists are talking about, and I, I think what really gets them uh, emotionally is that God has given us this terrible weight of responsibility. God sees you as a, as a big butt man. You know, <laughs> God sees you as an adult with responsibility. Uh, he's giving you this weight of uh, this heaviness of responsibility. Each of, us, each of us has this monumental choice with eternal consequences before us. An eternal love relationship with God or eternal separation from him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You're not a baby. Make a choice. And I've seen God, and, and I love nature. I'm looking at, I grew up looking at bugs all the time and looking at the sky. And uh, I was one of those people that likes to listen to the way snow settles and the way ice cracks and just put my hand on a, a tree. I like to feel stones. There's something about them. Uh, I just love rocks and stones. And, and I think about how creative God is and, and so many different kinds of people and each one of them so beautiful and special and unique. And I look at the stars and I think how far away they are. And when I look at a star, I'm seeing this light from how long ago? And yet God, the Bible says God flung the stars into space. Here they are. What a glorious God. And we only see a small part of his glory. <clears throat> God's goodness. I stand before you and I know that I'm broken. The fall broke the human race and I, I was broken as, along with it. And I'm not proud at all of the things that I've said to people in my life, the way I've treated people in my life. And I also stand before you and I just tell you, I believe God loves me. I believe God likes me. I believe God wants to be with me. That he's not bored when I want to talk with him. That he wishes I would talk with him more. And that's not because I think I'm such a great person that I warrant the attention of God. I think it's because God's so great and that God made each one of us so we could be in this relationship of love with him. And weak and foolish though I be, I've thought, and I can remember this when I was a little child, thinking, I want to be close to God. God's good. Why would I want to be apart from God? Uh, he wants to be my daddy, and I want to be his child. I look up at heaven and say, I want to be more like my dad. This is called faith. This is called faith. You've tasted the goodness of God. Your mind's starting to understand 
how wonderful he is, and you say, yeah, I want that. But don't think that if you choose to use your freedom to ignore God, that he's going to force you into heaven anyways. It doesn't work like that. Uh, he's too much of a gentleman to force himself on you. He won't violate the freedom that he's given you. And even though the Bible teaches that the very best way to describe the pain and anguish and regret that results from desiring separation from God is, is a burning fire, uh, most people live their lives doubting this. Uh, deep down, they think their way is better. They think they can get away with ignoring the Bible, ignoring God. They don't trust God enough <coughs> to follow him. When you don't trust God enough to follow him, this is called a lack of faith. Let's read uh, Matthew chapter 18 now. First nine verses. Matthew chapter 18. Two weeks ago we read the first part of this, but we're going to read it again for context. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Isn't that funny? When you feel kind of weird going to, going to Jesus and asking that, I think they were pretty good at religion. They probably covered it up, made it look a little, a little more holy. Uh, maybe kind of bragged about the things they were accomplishing as, as leaders in this movement. Jesus, to answer them, he calls over this little kid, calls over a little child. He placed the child in the center. He said, truly I say to you, unless you change, turn, convert, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to his disciples who are following him, but they may not be real believers yet. You need to change. Become like this little child or you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes a humble place, becoming like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever becomes, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. I think about how children can throw temper tantrums. That's not what Jesus is after. Children can pout. That's not what he's after. Jesus can complain. That's not what he's after. But who do children trust? If they're in a good relationship with their parents, they trust mom and dad. I remember when Megumi was little and we were watching this cartoon called Anastasia about the, some girl who thought she was a princess of Russia or something. And There's a point where there's a bad guy and he turns into a skeleton and Megumi was just a little girl. She's watching it like just... And the bad guy turns into a skeleton. She, boom, jumped across the room. She was in my arms in such a flash I could hardly... But she thought, the safest place I can be is with Dad. Do you know the safest place you can be is with Dad? That's childlike faith. I remember another time, this scares me to this day, my precious daughter, Chie, with those big, huge cheeks. Uh, we didn't know she'd gotten a hold of some lifesavers. And she was little. She couldn't talk yet. She had the whole role. And I remember she came running to me we were in Japan. I was on the tatami floor, the straw kind of floor. And she came around the corner. There was just fear and panic in her eyes. And my, my heart, you know, as a parent, right away, you're terrified too. And I saw this look into her, her eyes. And she was, and she couldn't make any sounds. I knew she was choking. Um, grabbed her. And I knew Heimlich's can hurt kids, but you try to do what you can. And then you'll go full bore if you have to. So I was trying a little Heimlich, turn her upside down, holding her by her legs, dumping her on the back. She coughed up a, coughed up a, a lifesaver. I thought, wow, I need a lifesaver. That's, it must have landed just right, so it blocked her breathing. And <laughs> she coughed up some more, and she started throwing up. And she had a bunch of lifesavers stuck in there with paper. <laughs> and I always think, thank goodness she ate. And I told her, thank you, thank you. You ran to Papa when you were scared. What if she had got scared, sat down in the room, and didn't know what to do? But she ran to her dad. Brothers and sisters, when you get scared, let's run to our Heavenly Father. Let's, let's trust. I can trust God. Yeah, I just stuffed a bunch of life things down my throat, but the place I got to go 
for healing. Run to God when we have trouble. Don't run away from God when we have trouble. That's not faith. That's lack of faith. <clears throat> Jesus says we have to become like one of these little guys with that simple faith. And Jesus puts a premium when we welcome children into the church, when we welcome children to, to Girls Bible Club, which has been going great. And uh, if you know any young ladies, invite them to that. Uh, invite the children to Sunday school class. Sunday school class is one of the best things ever invented for bringing children to faith in Christ. Did you know that? Millions of people come to faith in Christ through Sunday school class. Uh, let's read on through, through uh, 6 through 9 now. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone, remember we said a millstone? You think of something that grinds flour? Well, when you say a millstone, it's a huge stone that's pulled by a, a mule. So he's saying it's not one of these little ones that you grind your own flour with. It's one of those big communal ones. He said, if you mess with one of these little kids, it would be better for you than you are tied to one of these things and you're dropped into the ocean than to have me get my hands on you. Well, I thought this was a message about children. Shouldn't it be cute and sweet? And, and now, all of a sudden, God comes down from heaven. He becomes a human being. And he says, if you mess with one of my kids, you would wish you were tied to a millstone. Well, that's why I said God's not like an uncle who winks. Oh, isn't that cute? God is fierce. He's ferocious. He's scary. Jesus says terrifying things. If you don't want Jesus to say terrifying things, you're worshiping the wrong God. We studied the Old Testament. God not only says terrifying things, he does terrifying things. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is to fear God. You don't fear God, something wrong with you. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come. It's inevitable in a fallen world. But woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot cause you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. You know, I just kind of wish Jesus would have said that better. And I just kind of wish Jesus would stop talking sometimes. <laughs> If your hand or your foot cause you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter your life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. I was trying to study about this passage, and one guy was explaining at great length how Jesus is not really not talking about uh, hell here, so don't worry about that. Uh, you know, doesn't look like he's right to me. And nine, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell, which he's not really talking about. Uh, this is not the first time that we saw Jesus talking this way. Remember back in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the message from the beginning of creation to God incarnated himself, this is the message God chose to give. Wrap your mind around that. This is Christ's first public message. God comes in flesh from the beginning of creation to all those long years to this point. Here's what he comes to say. And among other things, remember we said the Sermon on the Mount is a war on human pride. It's a war on human religion. But Christ says there in chapter 5, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, 
cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. <clears throat> and we, we asked the question a couple weeks ago, who talks about hell more in the Bible than anybody? Of course, the answer is Jesus Christ. A few things jump out to me right away. One is, wow, that is like really intense. And I don't think it's my job to make it more comfortable. Jesus said it. Gouge out that eye. Cut off that hand. You don't want to burn in the fires of eternal damnation. I think pastors often want to sanitize Christianity, which is strange, or at least to make it more marketable, acceptable, uh, and honestly, we should try to speak to our culture in a way that they can hear. But sometimes, it's almost like we're trying to muzzle Jesus. And if I say I'm a Christ follower, why am I always trying to say, come to Jesus, uh, it's, your life will be wonderful, and Jesus is back there. And gouge out that eye, and I'm like, Jesus, not now, not now. I'm trying to get a bigger church, you know. Take my hand away. Or you have eternal fire, no, 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 no. <laughs> Why do pastors feel like we have to translate Jesus so that he's less scary? He's scary. But he died for you because he loves you. How often do you hear people try to explain away what Jesus said so that it's not as harsh as it originally sounded? That's kind of weird if you think about it. Uh, Non-Christians often point out that modern Christianity picks and chooses nice verses and ignores the rest of the Bible, which is why we go through it slowly, so we're not ignoring, we're not picking and choosing. Uh, the Bible often shows us, the Bible shows us totally, completely, not often. The Bible completely shows us, listen, God is good. Jesus loves you enough to be hammered to a cross, to suffer, to have the guilt of all your sins dumped on him, to die for you. But God isn't a sweetie. He's not cute. God is scary. I think what God was telling us at the Sermon on the Mount and what he repeats again here, his disciples, for the context, they ask him, we want to be great. We want to be better than other people. And Jesus is saying, there are things that you guys are clinging to. Could be pride could be selfish ambition, dreams. We cling, cling to our comfort. That's a big one for our flesh, isn't it? I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be put into hardship. How about secret sins? That unless we're willing to let go of them, will cause us not to bow the knee. And Jesus says, what are you holding on to that for? Better that your eye get cut off, better you cut off your hand. What are you holding on to that pride and ambition for? Cut it out of your life. Why are you holding on to those secret sins? Cut it out of your life. Because if your life is all about chasing fame or prosperity or, or, or popularity, that's going to damn you because it's your Lord and not me. You have to become like one of these children and just trust me completely. The disciples needed to get rid of their desire to be great if they were going to be right with God. I think at this point, it's standard for me to be open and transparent with you and list the things in my heart that I struggle with and keep me out of fellowship with God sometimes. But we don't have time right now, so moving on. Uh, but before I go on, uh, for a non-Christian, there are things that uh, you can cling to. A non-Christian, and, and by non-Christian, I mean maybe you call yourself a Christian, maybe you go to church, but deep down inside, you know, you're kind of doing things your own way. You're, 
you're really not putting God first and foremost in your life. Uh, maybe you realize you haven't really surrendered to God. You haven't asked uh, his forgiveness. You maybe think you don't have anything to, I think I'm a pretty good person. What do I have to have forgiven? Uh, for a non-Christian, uh, there are things that you can cling to. Maybe self-image. Maybe anger or, or bitterness. The, the need to fit in, right? We just want to fit in. And if I become too serious about this Jesus thing, guys at work aren't going to understand me. The girls are going to think I'm into some cult or something. Maybe what I'm clinging to is the quest for the almighty dollar. Whatever. These things can keep you from heaven. Jesus says, cut it out. Gouge it out. Throw it away. You need to be willing to cut these things out of your life. If they're causing you to stumble, they're getting you in the way of a relationship with me, cut it out. For believers now, uh, Christ already dealt with your sin on the cross. Your sin can't undo what God has already accomplished. However, those same things that we, I just listed, we need to cut those out of our lives too because they can wound us and ruin what God can do in and through us. And when we walk out of step with the Holy Spirit, when we're not unified with Christ, when we're not in fellowship, then we're kind of useless as Christians, aren't we? We, we might go to heaven, but our works will be burnt up, so we're going to be smelling like smoke. Uh, when we get there. Now, some Christians are going to read these verses about cutting away whatever causes us to sin, and they're going to say, oh yeah, i got to earn my salvation. i I got I to gotta go get this myself. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Otherwise, if you could earn your salvation, I want to make this very clear. If you could earn your salvation, there would not be a cross behind me right now. If you could earn your salvation, Jesus would not have gone through that for you. Capiche? Very clear, right? Other Christians are going to read these verses about cutting away whatever causes us to sin, and they immediately get into this theological game, and they, they do some mental gymnastics, and they, they start saying, well, it's not our job to do this, and so Jesus looks like he's saying to do this, but we're really supposed to relax and let go and let God, and Unless God does it for us, well, there's nothing that I can do. And so, you know, nothing we've seen in Matthew so far would justify reading the Bible like that. When Jesus says, do this, he means, go do this. Our principle for understanding what Jesus is saying since we started the book of Matthew, remember, our goal is to fall in love with Jesus by getting to know the real Jesus, not the cultural Jesus, not the Jesus we we, we imagine in our mind, but he's really has shown in scripture, is, is to try not to bring outside theological th theories, but just when Jesus says something, we just take it at face value. So, okay, well now, we're going to actually have one of those sweet, precious moments. Remember, uh, there are pre sweet, precious moments in scripture, and, and I like them. Christians love them, and that includes me. Let's look at one of those really neat verses that are fun. In verse 9. Uh, no. Verse, <laughs> verse 9 was more about eyes causing a stone, gouging them out. Which is, <laughs> you're thinking, what's wrong with pastor? Verse 10. See to it that you do not despise one of these little children. So he's still, on the, he's still got that little kid in the middle, right? He says, don't despise these little ones. Don't look down at them. For I tell you, their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now that is kind of a neat verse. It's very comforting to think about that. These little kids, maybe every believer, right? These little kids have an angel that watches over them in the presence of the Lord. Now, <coughs> I think that's beautiful. We, uh, we don't need angels. We got God the Father. He's watching over us. The angels watch over us because God tells us, tells them to. But it's kind of neat to think there's God the Father and we've got spiritual allies. We're not in this alone. There's an angel watching over. 
You know, it's also a little disturbing. In uh, I don't know, because of the way I'm built or something, in my life I often think, uh, I'm very aware that there's, there's a, spiritual, uh, a spiritual audience watching all the time, angels and demons, and that there's this spiritual war, and it's not, don't think of the war as going on around us, but the war actually involves us. And, and I know Jesus loves me, and I know the Father has forgiven me, and that the Holy Spirit's never going to leave me. But sometimes I wonder if the angels aren't kind of really disappointed in all of us. They serve God. You know an angel has never sinned? Now that's cool. They get to serve God without any self-doubt, without any self-reflection. They just get to serve God, and they've always served God. They've never betrayed him. They've never let him down. But they're also missing out on something really beautiful. An angel doesn't know the joy of being forgiven. They don't know what grace feels like to be messed up and hugged by God. Angels look at that. And they see how broken and fallen we are. And, they, and God of the universe, his voice echoes and thunders the angels, he's, God is so holy that even sinless angels have to cover their eyes in his presence. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. And then we basically give God the middle finger by the way we live, by the way we think, by the way we talk. And God goes over there and he's got holes in his hands because he loves us enough to suffer for us. He says, come on. You can do better, and I love you. And the angels are watching, King of kings, mighty God, creator of the universe, and they're watching. And they're learning about love. They're learning about grace by watching the way God interacts with us. And I wonder, though, sometimes they, they just don't understand. I mean, angels in the Bible are incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. They've never done anything wrong. Imagine that. Yet, they have to watch over us. And they're humble to Almighty God. And they have to watch us badmouth God. They have to watch us, maybe even worse than badmouthing God, ignore God. Apatheists, living our life apathetically to God, as if He didn't exist. Watch us doubt God. And I really, really wonder what they think. And <clears throat> we don't want to make big theologies over a few verses here. In, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it tells us that all angels are ministering spirits sent to take to minister a sa to those who are saved. All right, if you're a Christian, you've been saved by your sin. God has ministering spirits. Your soul is being attended to by angelic beings. <clears throat> And so I'm thinking hypothetically here, and I don't want to create rock-solid theologies, but I wonder, do they ever think, why does God bother with these guys? When we cry and we repent, we say, Lord God, forgive me. I've learned my lesson. And then we go right back into the same things that brought us pain the first time. I think we all look mentally damaged to a perfect angelic beings. Or they see us praising God and we're, we're singing and hallelujah and we're praying and we're acting so spiritual and they say, wait, I was just in that car ride on the way to church with you and you weren't acting so spiritual and holy then when you were hurry and you were trying to get the kids together. You didn't look so holy a few minutes ago. Or how about later on Sunday afternoon when your football team's losing? And the way we talk and the things we say and do about other people at church. And I wonder if the angels think, is this really the same guy who is just at church? How can they praise God and turn around and curse other people that God loves? How can they praise God and then talk bad about the bride of Christ, which is the church? I wonder when we give into our impatience and we give into our anger and we just let it flow and, and we just let our spouses have the double barrel of full stupidity, 
Uh, if the angels shake their heads in disbelief or if the angels weep. Let's look at Romans, tw uh, Matthew 18, 12 through 14. Talking about, this is all in the context of these little kids again. What do you think? Jesus is talking, if a man has a hundred sheep and just one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 sheep that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So you guys who want to be so great, cut it away. And don't do anything that could cause these little ones to stumble. Because if you're in this for yourself, that, could that will not only lead to your damnation, it could lead to the damnation of the people around you. The, th the way you talk, the way you treat people, is it drawing people to Christ or is it pushing people away? Christ doesn't want to lose even one little kid. Not even one. He's not willing that even one would perish. God's desire, God's desire is that every child in this broken world would grow up to know that he's real and that he really loves them. And that as bad as this world is, God has a better way. And God's ways are good and they're beautiful. And we don't have to treat each other this way. We don't have to be tearing each other down. We don't have to be living just for number one. All those things can be set aside and we can fall at the foot of the cross and say, thank you, Jesus. Your way is better than my way. I love you, God. Everything about you is beautiful. I want to be a part of this. Look how serious God is about every single child growing up, knowing his love, knowing who he is. We're going to talk about this more next week, but even that, even that part about cutting this stuff out of your heart, it's told in the context of people who just came to God saying, how can we be number one? And there's a little kid standing here, and Jesus saying, don't do anything that would cause one of these little ones to miss me. I don't want even one to miss me. Whatever it is going on in your life that could cause one of these little ones to miss me, cut it out. Cut it out of your life. God cares with a fierce love. God says, mess with these kids. It would be better for you if you tied a heavy rock to yourself around your neck and throw yourself in the seas than if I get my hands on you. Remember in the Narnian Chronicles? Talking about Aslan, that Christ-like figure. C.S. Lewis, the writer, he describes Aslan as this huge lion that represents Christ. He said he isn't a tame lion. But he is good. Brothers and sisters, God is not tame. And he will fight for his kids. He's ferocious. But he's good. And he loves us. Let's get right with God. The eternal, the, the alternative is eternal fire. How much better to be in the presence of this mighty God who loves us with such a fierce love that he would lay down his own life and suffer so that we could be in this relationship of love with him. We have this idea of yielding. You know, when you come to an intersection, you have to yield. You have to give the right away to the person. This idea of surrender, bowing the knee. Who are you going to bow to? Your self-image? 
What are you going to bow to? Lust? Greed? Some sports hero? Your job? I can't think of anything that I want to yield to the way I want to yield and submit myself to a God who loves me enough to die for me. I want to yield. I don't want to fight you, God. Everything about you is good. I'm going to pray right now. And I invite you, sisters, brothers, if you're already Christian, let's continue to be in this process of surrendering ourselves again and again and again. And if you're not a believer yet, today is the day of salvation. And you can do this right now. Just close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll pray together. And you can begin this journey of faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, everything about you is good. Your ways are so high and noble and pure and wonderful. Lord, I cannot follow any theory, any philosophy, any psychology, any religion that doesn't take my brokenness seriously. Lord, I'm messed up. I'm a sinner. I need somebody to reach down and save me, somebody who can do something about this. I don't need excuses. And I don't need to be told that I'm good enough on my own. I know I'm not. Lord God, please forgive me. I see you. I see your love. I want to be part of that. I want to follow you each and every day. Lord God, thank you for Jesus Christ coming and dying for my sin, taking responsibility for all the darkness. Thank you. Thank you for dying for me. I want to live for you. Please, Lord God, help me to be... I want to be in your family. I want to stand for goodness and love and beauty and all the things that you stand for. Lord God, please use me now to love other people, to be a blessing to those around me. And Lord God, please use my life to bring more people into your family. I pray this, Jesus, in your precious name. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.